There's also a PDF
Um, Um, so, so what's happening? What's happening is that there are these trends that that are taking place that are affecting uh, the world around us, and that's really how the whole idea of smart cities, or the awareness of smart cities as a as a market, as an initiative, got started. We look at what's happening across the world in terms of, of demographics. Western, Western world in Europe, U.S., uh, Northern, Northern uh, is changing dramatically, and um, and also shrinking. People are having fewer kids and later in life. Um, the, the baby boomers are aging out now, and a lot of people are not having children. And so what you're seeing is that the average uh, number of people, if I'm looking at the numbers, is going up dramatically in the West. If you look at places like Brazil, or you look at Indonesia, you look at other places in, in Africa, the, the populations are exploding. And so when you juxtapose those two things, you have a situation in which you have more productivity and more demands on health care. And um, then when you look at the hyper growth areas, you have high demands on the need for education and for, for jobs, but you don't have access to, uh, to the, the means to get that. You don't have access to is probably going to be able to prepare for the jobs that are coming. So you'll remember Arab Spring came out of a situation in which the, the youth was rebelling about the fact that they didn't have access to, to the things that they needed to change their lives. And that's essentially, Smart City sort of grew out of the, the recognition of we better fix this or, you know, with, with uh, you can go to the next one, with Urban
part of the talk and, and, and what you were saying was, was just wound it up for this, this whole thing was we have to be knowledgeable about what's happening so that we can have a voice in how things roll out, how the technology rolls out. And because Portland is particularly sensitive to engagement and um, you know, diversity and inclusion, which is a great thing, we have an opportunity really to influence the way um, the technology happens in this town and we have access, we're not too many um, you know, the six degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon, when there's not too many sep uh, degrees of separation from the people who are making decisions here, fortunately, and we can influence, you know, what they're doing. So let's, uh, let's move forward and I'll go kind of rapidly through the rest of them. So, um, yeah, so rapid urbanization, we talked a little bit about that. People are moving into cities, you can go to the next one. Uh, people are moving into the cities at the rate of 10,000 people per hour. And that would mean that in order to serve those people, we would need to build a city the size of New York every month for the next 26 years. Well, that's not going to happen. So we have to figure out how to use our resources better so that we're able to serve those people moving into, um, into, uh, into cities quickly. Um, you know, we, we know what those challenges are in cities that are, that are getting crowded. We've got traffic, you got your pollution, you got your trash, you got your emergency situations. I was in a, in a, in traffic in Bangalore at one time. Bangalore has uh, 12 million people and uh, it was bumper to bumper for about two and a half hours and next to me was an ambulance that had its siren going and there was absolutely nowhere for that ambulance to go. So I hope that person in the back made it because you know, it, it's to the point where, where it's so choked that even having emergency vehicles is, is, is sort of pointless. They can't, they can't get through. Um, okay. We talked about this. These are the kinds of challenges that cities face. So the question is, what if, next, what if we had, we had an efficient and effective, affordable digital infrastructure when we go about solving our city's challenges in the same way? Um, yeah. Um, next. So when we look at the cost of computing, next. you can see over the last 25 years, the cost of computing has come dramatically down in terms of the, the, the cost of the components that are inside of computers. What used to be $220 for um, mega, the, 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 the transistors that work inside of the computers, and I can't remember what the second M stands for, sorry, um, uh, down to four cents. So fairly dramatic. Let's go to the next one. Uh, storage, the price per gigabit, gigabyte of storage. Next one gone from $569 per gigabyte. And now, you know, you, you have so much free storage, you don't know what to do with it. You know, people are giving you thumb drives with 128 gigabytes of storage on them. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, bandwidth, same story, remarkable. So what we're looking at is objects being connected to the internet. And by 2020, which is, you know, this coming year, there's supposed to be 50 billion objects connected to the internet, all of them talking, all of them sending data, all of them contributing to this big data, massive deluge. So how do we make sense out of this? And how do we determine what information we want to give up, what information we need to use, who needs to use it, what kinds of, of, of decisions does it support? And um, I'm going to go to uh, also video is huge. Video by 2021, I believe video is going to be 82% of the traffic that crosses the, the internet. And that's because we're learning from video now. People are reading less. Um, the ways that we communicate is very different now. And so, so we're looking at ways to have, you know, that, that, that causes a, a backlog in bandwidth. So there, there have, has to be, uh, you know, lots of new compression algorithms, bigger bandwidth, fiber, fiber broadband. I, I naturally work now with, um, with Link Oregon, which is a new startup here. That's a consortium of the four, um, uh, research universities and the state of Oregon through the office of the CIO and <clears throat> together they're, de they're de developing a program to provide uh, fiber broadband to all the public and nonprofit agencies across the state. So the schools, the, the, the public hospitals, the native tribes, the libraries and the state offices in every corner of Oregon because in the cities we have no problem with bandwidth but in, in uh, access to the internet. But when you get out to the corners of the state, it gets very different. And so this is a, an effort to make sure that we have the opportunities for education, for healthcare, for all the things that this provides help through that way. 
the, the kids that are coming up now, this is their first language. They have a very high level of expectation of what they should be able to, be, to do. And so, um, I mean, maybe some of you guys feel that way already. No, it's true. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's what their expectation is. And so cities really need to provide that in a way that uh, is meaningful to them. So there's also, you know, a ton of new terms that are not necessarily easy to understand for people and they want to be able to, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They want to be able to grok what all this stuff means together and how, how this works. Um, what I like to, to tell people is that, you know, even though I've been working in this area for the last six, seven, six or seven years, and I've been in technology for 30 years, you know, I don't understand all of this stuff and I don't understand how it's going to work together necessarily. And I think all of us are going to have to make those decisions as time goes forward. What shiny objects are going to fall by the wayside, what are going to be the most profound, how these pieces are going to work together, how the data between them is going to work. And we're going to get to make some of those decisions, which is another reason why you have to stay on top of what's happening. So that with the decisions about whether you use blockchain for votes or whether you, you know, what kind of robot ends up in your living room to, you know, take your dinner order uh, in, in the next 10 years, you know, how, how you end up making choices about, um, you know, where you work and, and whether you go to work or whether you work from home. All those kinds of things are going to be um, coming up in the next 10 years and all of these different are going to play, play a role. So one of the things in order to see the way systems work and, and in order to understand how to change them, we have to question how things currently work. So what kinds of questions can we, ask, can we ask about the systems that we're currently in place to be able to determine where we find opportunities for change? And I'm going to turn that over to you to do the, the, you can do the exercise or, or I can just, well, so, okay. Uh, the hand out there. Um, so, the, so, so if, can, can you think about some questions that you might ask about the current system, be it transportation systems or other systems that are around us, that would kind of get at the, 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 the core of why we do things a certain way and where the opportunities are for how to change them? I can give you some examples, but I want to kind of see if anybody has some ideas first. Anything? Maybe some examples. Okay. Let's go to the next. One. So, do we do we have to go to the doctor? Seventy percent of the time, the doctor doesn't even need to touch you anymore. He gets your vitals. A nurse comes in, or or a physician's assistant comes in, takes your vitals, provides that information to the doctor, tells the doctor why you're there, what you need, what your symptoms are. The doctor comes in, looks at the chart. He won't probably even touch you. Maybe he'll, you know, ask you to move around this way or that way. You might poke your knee with something, you know, see if you have any reflexes. And then he makes a diagnosis and he gives you a drug. A lot of that stuff can be done online now. You don't actually need to go to the doctor anymore. So are there other kinds of things that occur to you that, that, that you could question? And this is, you know, uh, a lot of people now are, are able to consult with a, with a healthcare professional on their, on their iPads. This uh, sleep number bed, it now tracks uh, how well you're sleeping and can report that back to you. They also aggregate that information to figure out whether people are sleeping better based on the, the, the number of beds. There's a, a bra that's been developed that can detect um, as few as 10,000, I believe it's 10,000 um, breast cancer cells, which is way before uh, normally the test that when you go to the doctor can detect it. It's a lot more cumbersome to be able to, to, to have to do that to, in a hospital. But they, this, this is starting to look at, uh, at being built into bras and it was designed by a kid whose mother had of breast cancer and he developed the sensors that fit into the bra to be able to detect the changes in temperature that, that indicate that there's something going on there with, with cell growth. Um, this particular item right here is a, is a water sensor that was developed that can fit into your cell phone. It was developed by NASA to test whether water was drinkable for astronauts, but it can be used any place in the world to find out whether the water is potable. Um, usually a week after a baby's born, they have to go back into the hospital, have their hearing tested. But they're also exposed then to all kinds of diseases and <coughs> germs and so forth. So they can do that remotely now. Um, um, and then there's pills that you can swallow to find out what's going on in your digestive system and also whether drug, other drugs that you're taking are uh, counter, um, what's the word, counterindicated or they're clashing with one another. So clean water is an issue. How can we ensure that there's water for everybody? Um, how do we figure out where the next scholars are going to be, where the next generation of surgeons and architects and cellists are, and get them the education that they need wherever they are? 
students that don't have access to the kind of schools that you guys have access to. Um, this is an example of Cisco set up, see the screen over here, Cisco set up a telepresence screen. This is Hershey, the Hershey School in Her Hershey, Pennsylvania, the Milton Hershey School. And this is where the, the kids whose parents are the executives at Hershey Chocolate in Pennsylvania go to school. That's where the kids whose parents pick the plants that make the cocoa in Ghana go to school. And they share a social studies class together. So they have an opportunity to learn from each other and to, to, to understand what their lives are like and to share information about who they are very, very early on. Um, we have to go to every garbage truck, every garbage can every time. They're coming out now with sensors that you put in a garbage can that can tell whether it's full, whether it's on fire, whether it smells bad. And then the trucks are able to decide what their route's going to be based on optimizing which truck, which cans need to be picked up. So it cuts back on the pollution of the trucks, cuts back on the, uh, the uh, trucks blocking traffic and creating more traffic. So there's opportunity for, for that to happen. Um, traffic, we can look at why there's traffic. Often people are slowed down in traffic looking for parking. So if we can figure out how to direct people to parking before they're slowed down and slowing down traffic, we can save a lot of traffic. Um, so this is an example of what a uh, digital platform looks like. And, and uh, there's, there are a number of companies out there that are making them, including Cisco. And what that does is it pulls information from different sensors and mixes that information across the platform, makes first level analysis, which is called edge computing. If you think of, um, or fog computing, which I like, if you think of, of information in the cloud, if you bring the cloud down to the ground, it's called fog. So fog computing is where you do the first level of analysis of information that's coming on, um, like put, they put sensors at the top of light poles, for example, to test seismic activity, particulates in the air, <coughs> um, different kinds of, of environmental things that are going on. They can also check for whether there's available parking or whether somebody's illegally parked in a particular area. All these kinds of information come from sensors, from mobile devices, uh, from, from different you know, um, databases. And these platforms that are out there now are designed to aggregate this information and then bring it up to an API level so that they can, so people can write software that will pull that data out and allow in a, almost real time to, uh, to send that out to agencies that are making decisions about you know, transportation, about safety, about lighting, about garbage, about water, all those kinds of things. So that's kind of what that looks like. It's big business. And you can look over there at, at uh, kind of what the amount of money is associated with um, these different, you know, these different areas. And growing out of this awareness of all of these different industries being connected to the internet is what's called an urban services industry. And that um, amounts to about, that amounts to about a $3 trillion industry. And, and what that means is that as all of this information gets loaded into the internet, it no longer takes someone who's local to a particular place to manage those systems. So you can have expertise anywhere in the world manage particular systems. Now there's, you know, there's benefits and there's liabilities to that. People who are closer to the problem understand what's going on in the communities and they understand what it means to, to, to specialize in, in what that particular community needs. But the economies of scale that uh, companies that manage larger swaths of, of the planet are able to bring to these challenges is also um, a boom. So if you go to the next one. So this is an example. Uh, there's a company called Takadu that's in Israel. And um, as we know, you know, Israel faces a lot of challenges with water. Um, they have placed sensors at, or they take advantage of sensors that have been placed in water pipes. And they're able to manage the water leakage in Santiago, Chile, in uh, Adelaide, Australia, and in a number of other cities around the world because they have that expertise and they can manage it because the information is already coming into the internet. So that expertise exists. Okay. So, you know, this is basically looking at the fact that different communities have different needs and we need to also tap into what those different needs are. We need to take advantage of different ways of engaging with the communities. Portland is pretty good at that. There are a lot of other cities that sort of after the fact, they ask communities what they want. But the real opportunity to make changes and to make those changes stick is in 
finding out from different communities what their needs are and figuring out the best way to manage that across the different communities. So we have to, you know, put this puzzle together of what we want our cities to look like. Um, and there's different partnerships that are going to come out of that. Different financial partners, <coughs> different uh, vendors, different technology vendors that are working together. Um, so you get a sense that it really takes a very new way of doing business in order for, for these kinds of, of uh, processes to work. Um, this is just a, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but some of the cities that are made some dramatic changes. That they're working on traffic and, and pedestrian uh, safety, um, trash can sensors, um, lighting and parking, and uh, Copenhagen is trying to be carbon neutral by 2025. And so they're really working the transportation and, and a lot of the other ways that they're optimizing their, um, their resources is, is uh, pretty remarkable. And Portland's a little bit, I mean, this book is very, very similar. My brother lives in Copenhagen, it's very similar. Okay, uh, let's see. I borrowed from your slides, but um, yeah, so I want to turn it over to, um, to Adrian and uh, to take a deeper dive on transportation. So, oh, um, so. <laughs> what? Oh. Yeah, before we do all that, we're going to like okay. stop and take a, oh, yeah. a breather okay. for a second. Yeah. Um, that's a lot it's of a information lot. Yeah. that we're throwing at you, uh, drinking from a digital fire hose, I think. Might be. Um, and so, um, you, do we want to do the? Um, James. Yeah, James. Okay. Yeah, James. Are you ready? This James? might be a good. It's a good segue. It's a good segue. <laughs> yeah. So what, what we are going to want to do at, at the end of the whole thing? Come on, come on up because we will have to yeah. do next. What we are going to want to do at the end is take a step back from the technology and the solutions and the how, um, and talk more about. Um, how we want these kinds of things to happen in our communities and what we can do, you know, kind of bringing it back to the, the conversation that this class is all about is how do we work together um, with our communities to try to have these rather challenging conversations about a lot of new emerging technologies and say, how do we want to implement this in your community? How does this resonate with you? What does this mean to you? And, and not have our tech companies or our city government or whoever else just say, here's the solutions. We're solving all your problems, even though we haven't worked with you to understand your pain points. So with that, we're going to sort of take a step back from the technology, talk about some human stories around transportation and, and dealing with, with our city. Then we're going to take an actual break break, and then we'll come back and kind of deep dive into the transportation side of this whole conversation and then kind of turn it into a class um, exercise after that. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, this class is actually brought to you by the Jade District. You didn't know that. Yeah, we <laughs> did. Because I ran into Anne at the Jade District Night Market this past summer. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you in a while. We should talk about what you're working on. And so that was how I reconnected with I Anne. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then, like, Adrian and I have worked together many for many years. And I didn't know they were actually, like, working on stuff together. So that's how... I finally I brought them together, which is really weird because I know you two from different spaces. But Jane herself, she and I sat on the Jade District Steering Committee for about three or four years. And I recently stepped down after a little bit of time. And I stepped down in years ago <laughs> after. <laughs> I have other things I need to do as well. Yeah. But um, I, Jane and I did this really kind of a sweet story vignette stories to these kids at the Sunnyside Elementary School. And what we shared during that time. Where my daughters went. To that's where your daughters went. Yeah, small world. Maybe your kids are there too. But um, what they had asked us to share were um, <clears throat> untold stories of Portland, of our history and our past. And mine, we can talk later, but I really <clears throat> want to bring Jane back to talk about the urban renewal project that took place in the 60s, 70s here in Portland and how her family has impacted. It really touched me because of of what we enjoy now as a beautiful Keller Auditorium and a fountain and a civic place for everybody. And little did I know my friend's family has been impacted in the past. So here's James. So we're gonna go from high tech to low tech. I'm not <laughs> no, I think this is I'm really gonna have a whole lot of yeah. <clears throat> PowerPoints. But, um, let us know when you're ready. For yeah, I'll, I'll let you know when I'm ready. So um, thanks for letting me share the story. 
I'm still coming down from my bike ride, so that's not related to transportation. <laughs> uh, I had to go up a few hills to get here from work. So um, anyway, uh, it's kind of ironic that I'm here today because about 52 years ago, to two months up to this day, um, our county experienced an earthquake that changed the direction of our lives in a pretty huge way. And um, I've got here, I, I'm, I'm kind of about uh, tangible things, like um, you guys can handle that. Not hot tech. <laughs> you guys here okay? Um, so um, if I had a bigger bike bag, I would have brought more things to share with you, but I did bring a couple things. Um, but here's a letter um, that my dad um, received on uh, September 11, 1967. And um, so before I go into that, so it's kind of weird that I'm here in November, um, 1919. And, and, and I was about his age when he got this letter. So it's just bizarre that I'm here. <laughs> So I feel like, in a way, I'm telling the story to give him a voice because he didn't have a voice to, sh to I guess, respond to. So this letter was September 11, 1960. And this was the letter of the demolition of the building? Well, I'll, I'll just kind of make it a surprise. <laughs> I want to get you guys all, you know. <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> but before I uh, tell the story, I want to show you a picture of my father just to kind of, so you can make a connection to who I'm talking about. And my, my dad, and I won't go into great detail here about his life, um, he immigrated to the US when he was 13. And I think he first got to San Francisco and then eventually made his way to Portland. Um, and uh, fast forward, uh, World War II, um, he served as a, served in, enlisted in the military, and that was during the time of the Japanese anti-sentiment. So I really feel like a lot of Chinese men, because it was mostly immigrant men that were here, Chinese men, enlisted to show his patriotism, to show that he's American. And because he was pretty old, he was in his 40s, he, he wasn't sent into combat. Instead, he was sent to a, a military base in the Midwest. And he moved up the ranks pretty quickly to become a sergeant. And basically his role was to feed the hundreds of men every day, the soldiers every day. And you know, he could have done more, but back then they only allowed minorities to do certain things. But I think my dad would have been capable of quite a bit more. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of choices back then. So, so he gained a lot of skills um, feeding lots of people. And soon after that, so I'm just piecing the story together because my dad passed away when I was about eight. And luckily, I had his real, his income taxes from 1951 to um, of the restaurant that he owned in, um, I don't know what they would call that district. Uh, it was on Southwest Third, just blocks north of uh, the Coin Building. And it was a moderately successful restaurant. It was in a really uh, rough part of town. And he served people that the white restaurants only served, so basically the black community, black customers, Native Americans, uh, really poor uh, white male day laborers that lived in that area. So that area uh, had a lot of boarding houses. They called them hotels. So you can go to the next slide. And they had what they called SROs, single residency, single residency. Units. So basically, their rooms were just enough for your bed, practically. And uh, my dad lived in that type of. Uh, so this is a miniature. I I went to go see an exhibit in San Francisco Chinatown, and this guy Fred Wong. He was he was like I think the first minority that was hired by Hollywood, Frank Wong, um, to be a stage designer, and he did all these old vignettes of. Chinatown, but this is San Francisco, but this is very similar to the kind of housing that very poor people lived in. So downtown was dotted with these hotels. So my dad's SRO was on um, Southwest Second, restaurant was on Southwest Second. So 
So yeah, it was a pretty rough way to live. Um, you share the kitchen and the bathroom. Um, he worked really hard. And so I luckily, you know, there's just a few things that's giving me clues about his life. Um, here's a menu I'm gonna pass around, typed on card and paper <laughs> from his restaurant. So uh, one to 60 cents each. And so when I calculate the revenues from the tax uh, returns, he probably served like 100 to 170 a day. So, uh, and it was so cheap that he attracted a lot of customers. And basically he attracted the people that no one else would serve. And for him, he didn't care. It was about making a living. But it was a rough part of town. I found an article where he was uh, a witness to a murder right in front of his uh, restaurant. And I, I remember very distinctly we kept the gun behind the counter. So, uh, and I also want to share this with you. It just kind of humanized my father. This is an abacus, obviously. And I remember when I was growing up hearing the plan came out with you know, these seeds, you know, and he basically did all his records with them for his business models. And he even tried to teach me uh, math on this, but don't ask me how to do it now. So we'll pass that around. It's probably close to 100 years old. Uh, so anyway, uh, so getting back to that fateful day. Um, so so the, 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 the restaurant was called the Sherman Cafe, and it was on the bottom floor of the Sherman Hotel, which is not, like I said, a hotel, but a boarding house. And there was about 100 residents that lived in these similar housing and they were very cheap. And and I think it was basically poor immigrants and like I said, white single male laborers that lived in these, these types of housing. Um, but you know, when I was trying to understand what happened in my father's business, so we weren't living in, in, in that area by the time that the South Auditorium Urban Renewal Project happened, which, does anybody know about that? Or you know? Yeah, it's urban, happened during, yeah. The, like the fountain area? You're yeah, about? yeah. There was like a plaque that kind of explained Oh, okay. Yeah. But you, you probably lived during that time with Kurt Jones and behind me, right? Yeah. Okay. High school. Okay. So um, that area used to be a neighborhood. It was predominantly Italian and Jewish people, but also there were black families and Asian families in there. And they displaced these 1700 people and basically destroyed the neighborhood. In 1949, there was a housing act that passed by Congress. After World War II, they wanted to revitalize cities make sure that there's enough housing for Americans. I'm gonna put this in air quotes. <laughs> uh, and that included like putting in things like hospitals, expanding universities, educational systems, and office type buildings to improve the economy. But there was a huge price that, were, that was paid to that. And what I found interesting, it was how they justified what areas they chose. So like today, it's from Keller Auditorium to Lair Hill, which is on the other side of the Ross Island Bridge, just across. Um, and then there's the Sunset Highway that they built for that project. And so the federal government was, was going to pay two thirds of the cost. That's a lot of money. What was really important to me, I found out that, can you, can you, what do you think it costs to make that fountain across from the Keller Auditorium? In 1970. <laughs> a million dollars? Well, it was a half million, but that is a lot of money. I don't think we would even spend that money today. So it's like, how did that happen? Um, so, and Jewish and Italians at the time, they were, they faced discrimination too because they were Catholic and they weren't quite fully adopted into white, white privilege. I know some Jewish people from that period, it's a, they had a lot of racial things happen to them during that period. So we kind of forget that there was a time when that community was not considered white. 
and all the privileges that come with that. So I'm going to just be honest with you. <laughs> now it's maybe a little bit different. Um, so um, when I was reading about the Urban Renewal Project, there was a lot of terms used to describe places. And the, the word that came up a lot was the word blight. And when you look at that word in the dictionary, it's a word to describe the disease and basis of the disease that affects plants, fungus, mildew. But what's interesting, when they started doing urban renewal, uh, the School of, uh, School of Chicago Sociology Department was doing urban uh, poverty studies, and they, they appropriated this word to describe communities. So it's very interesting. Um, so I wanted to read a lot about, uh, read more about, you know, what does that mean? So I found an article called See, the meaning of blight from the Chicago city, citylab.com site, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. And um, this guy quoted Wendell Pritchett. Uh, he's a University of Pennsylvania law scholar. He, he, did, he had my like, special team of property law. And he wrote, to secure political and judicial approval for their efforts, renewal advocates created a new language of urban decline. The discourse of blight. Blight, you know, proponents argue, was a disease that threatened to turn healthy areas into slums. The vague amorphous term blight was a rhetorical device that enabled renewal advocates to reorganize property ownership by declaring certain real estate dangerous to the future of the city. <laughs> To make a case for a renewal program, advocates contrasted the existing deteriorated state of urban areas with the modern efficient city that would replace it. Urban revitalization required the condemnation of blighted properties and the transfer of this real estate to developers who would use it more productively. And he goes on to say that blight was a facially neutral term infused with racial and ethnic prejudice. While it purportedly assessed the state of urban infrastructure, blight was often used to describe the negative impact of certain residents on city neighborhoods. This scientific method of understanding urban decline was used to justify the removal of blacks and other minorities from certain parts of the city. So in Portland, think of Albina and Ian Hospital. Very sad, that community has been displaced five times in history short history of Portland is terrible. So by selecting racially changing neighborhoods as blighted areas and designating them for redevelopment, the urban renewal program enabled institutional and political elites to relocate minority populations and entrench racial segregation. This is a gem of a quote from um, a New York City urban planner. Justin Garrett Moore says, I can get a grant or funding to do something if I use the word blight to describe my community. And even our president recently used that word to describe the, the inner city. <laughs> so that word has not gone away. Um, and, and to me, I feel like that's a very, it's a destructive term that's been used to justify, and I use really hard terms, decimating communities for the sake of giving the, you know, the benefits to a small few. Um, so can you move to the map? I think there's some maps. I'll try to be quick because I'm running out of time. I did it before and after. Oh, okay. Before so you. so this is something I found at the Oregon Historical Society. So supposedly it's the, the original project stopped there. But as they got closer to finishing the project or maybe they finished it, said, hmm, we don't want to be next to this glided area. And the stocks say clearance. I want to mow it down. So my dad's restaurant was just a few blocks in there. Unfortunately, he got nailed. <laughs> uh, and they did use the term blight. Let's get rid of this blighted area because now that we have a new you know, project, we want to address what we can. So this letter, because I like tangible things. 
uh, was sent by the uh, property owner, property management company. And so what's really strange was September 5th, the week, six days before, there was a fire in the hotel <laughs> that, that, created, that uh, caused $75,000 in damage. And I just kind of wonder why, how that convenient happened. Then six days later, my dad gets a letter uh, from the property management saying this, um, the lessors have given an option to purchase the property described on lot seven and eight, lot 130, city of Portland and the city of Portland, Multnomah County, known as the Sherman Hotel property, which includes the property covered by within the described lease. This option has been accepted by the Portland Development Commission, which is today called Progress Portland. To whom title will be conveyed? In accordance to the provisions of the paragraph 20 of the lease, hereby notify the lease of the development commission uh, relative to the future tenancy in all matters in connection with the recent fire damage to the premises. Strange. <laughs> so this was an earthquake moment for my father. I try. I'm trying to imagine what that would have been like to say, "Hey, we're gonna shut down your business." And I was calculating in today's dollars. So my dad was only able to go to grammar school. He was a very intelligent man, but he was very segregated. He, he was like a lot of typical immigrants in the early days where they saved as much as they could to send money back to their families. And he lived in those S and SRL, very basic. You know, he went to sleep, got up, went to work. You know, it was just kind of like this, this uh, treadmill. Uh, so he lived on very little, but he was able, like I said, to serve over a hundred customers a day. And, and even at one time he had a contract with Penn Hotel and Bowling Homes, which is located, I think, just a block away, where he probably fed the workers. So when they decided to go and went ahead and extend the project, I think it was 16 blocks, they wanted 30 blocks more, uh, they left a few businesses there, and that was uh, the coin TV and radio station and uh, Boyd Coffee, that was a really big company back in the day. <laughs> and uh, the Sailor Union Hall, I think, that was a possibility. I don't know if that really happened. So it's interesting what they decide to keep in place and what needs to go. So I found uh, a document my, that my dad, my dad was politically. Like a lot of early Chinese, they had civil rights organizations. And my dad was actually one of the founding members. I found out recently of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance. I was so shocked. I found his picture at the Oregon uh, Historical Society. So I, I'm really hoping I'm doing him justice by giving him a voice to this story today. That's for me the biggest pressure than anything else. <laughs> um, and so he, he a lot of Chinese use the law to try to advocate for their rights. And so my dad used lawyers very frequently. And he did hire a lawyer to try to get the Portland Development Commission to give him a better settlement and cover moving costs. But unfortunately, it doesn't cover the loss of your business. So my dad's business ended up in Northeast Portland, the Coley neighborhood, which was back in the 60s, late 60s, it was like getting sent to Siberia. So he went from over 100 customers a day to barely 20 a month. So, um, you know, it destroyed our family security, basically. And um, my dad was kind of already in ill health, um, and it just kind of put an end to his life. He didn't live a whole lot longer after that. I really in the future. So my mom had to work, and then when my sister was old enough, which was probably 15, she started working. I was really young. So we went from like in today's dollars, 50,000 a year to barely 20,000 a year. But we were one of the lucky ones because my dad had the informant of my 
other we met at the SRO, she was pregnant with me. Um, and then he raised my daughter here, you know. Um, so she, he bought a house, fortunately. Um, so for us, we were lucky, you know, we had a home. So when he passed away, at least we had a home that was already paid off. Um, but I think about all the other people that wasn't as lucky as us. People in the black community that constantly in these places, the Memorial Coliseum and Mississippi Avenue. I mean, there's just constantly, for us, we were lucky. You know? So, um, I have other slides. Oh, okay. So I, I, we didn't take pictures when we were going up, but this was a picture. So the hotel was right here, and I think my dad's restaurant was somewhere there. That's the best picture I could find. And this was the Rose Hotel that was already in demolition. What's this the top cafe right there in the corner? Right. right. Oh, yeah. Is it same cafe? Along the oh! Side. Back, back, back one more. Right there. Really? Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah it's really bad. Oh, interesting. Maybe because yeah. now I see that because it's a really tiny picture. Yeah, now you're seeing that. I know. <laughs> That's it. So, yeah, they were, the Portland Development Commission was already demoing that hotel. And then that, yeah, it's just weird, the whole thing. So, um, okay, I think I'm, I'm going to finish up here. So, yeah, so that was the impact that that had on my family. And I think when we think about creating shiny new things, we have to think about the next era. And who do you want to include once we build this thing? How do we include people that normally aren't? That's it. Let's <laughs> go to the next one. The shiny new things. Oh, oh yeah. Are, sir. Oh, you could, yeah. You could so, so I did an aerial of this. Let's <coughs> go to the next one. And then this is where we are. Really, that's what got demoed to create this and the next one. And our Keller Auditorium, which I think is really ironic because this weekend I'm actually going to, going to Keller Auditorium to watch Miss Saigon. <laughs> which is my own history, my own past coming here from from Vietnam to to America. So it kind of like a full circle. Yeah, let's break. Let's get offline and let's break um, for about ten minutes. Thank you, Jane. Sorry. <laughs> 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 um, oh. <sighs> oh.
world. Back on? Okay. All right, thank you. Um, well, uh, so we're off to a pretty interesting start in the discussion. And there is a little bit of a method to the madness here where we talk about big picture, smart cities, data, all the, the drinking from the fire hose stuff that I uh, was talking about first, and then bringing it back down to a very human, very real level. Um, I'm going to talk much more like focused in on the transportation elements of uh, where we see a lot of stuff going with the future of smart mobility specifically. So taking all the bigger picture things Anne was talking about down in the transportation world. Um, and, uh, and we'll actually kind of come back to some elements of Jane's story and a couple different points here, and then we'll turn this into hopefully a, a class exercise at the end. We'll spend some time working together and talking through some of these things. So I'm Adrian Piermine with the consulting firm DKS Associates. We are a traffic and transportation engineering and planning firm. Um, our biggest office and, and now our corporate headquarters is here in Portland. Uh, we have offices up and down the West Coast in Seattle, Portland, Salem, Oakland, uh, Sacramento, Austin, Texas, and, um, and so my, my responsibilities with, within the company are, are with all of those. I'm the national director, but luckily for me, that means West Coast pretty much. So I don't have to travel too much across the country, um, but I'm focused around all these new emerging areas of uh, technology and, and smart mobility and how that's going to impact our cities. And um, so we'll talk about what that means here. So um, let's go to the next slide. And when we talk about the, um, oh, I was going to have you do it except for when I have a hand for the slides, but um, <clears throat> this first one. So when we think about the future of transportation and mobility, I go to where I first started to learn about the future. Oh, it's not doing it. <laughs> yeah. So when I first started learning about the future of transportation and the flying car and all these great things was this TV show called Jetsons. Um, and I'm only going to show a, a little brief clip of this um, because there's one main point that I, when I was watching this recently, that I thought was a pretty funny comment. So first of all, we got the flying car here, um, but it's still got a steering wheel, still got a human being driving this. So we're that far into the future that we've got flying cars where he's driving except for when he's not and clearly the technology is there to have it be self-driving because he's dropping the kids off in these little flying saucers to go to their schools after he drops them off turns back around and um and starts driving his rocket ship again or his little flying car he's got to stop doing presentation so what what i thought was funny about that is we're we're talking about self-driving cars now and i and when i talked to the older well when, when i looked at that um, it's like if the technology is there for it to be self-driving, why is he still controlling the vehicle? And I'm like, oh, it's a generational thing. It's the old white guy that will not give up control. And my kids will be totally fine getting into the self-driving rocket ship, but the old guy's got to got to control it. And so when we think about the um, the flying car, uh, we thought you know that's going to solve all of our problems, right? The reason that we have all this congestion problems because we're constrained on this two-dimensional roadway. And if we could just get up into the air, then uh, congestion goes away. But clearly, uh, the Jetsons also taught us that, that flying cars are not going to get rid of congestion. It, it just uh, gives us a whole new problem. And so um, the other thing we've been talking about for a very long time, um, 70, 70 plus, 70 years, um, self-driving electric vehicles. So if we've been talking about self-driving electric vehicles and flying cars for 50, 60, 70 years, what's different now in 2019 as we go into 2020 than has been over the last 50, 60, 70 years? It's, um, Anne was talking about the, the plummeting of the cost of technology, the cost of those transistors, the cost of memory, the cost of broadband, all of those elements are making it far more affordable to be able to deliver on the technology that we've been talking about 50 or 60 years, and the money that's getting invested into building these technologies, whether it's self-driving or flying, and is, is tremendous. There's a lot of money being invested here. And so we think about businesses like Uber, Lyft, and businesses like Amazon, who have tremendous 
bottom line incentive to get rid of the human driver in their vehicles to continue to reduce the cost of um, what it takes to deliver their service, whether they're moving people or moving packages, they're incredibly incentivized. The technology, the cost of these technologies has come down to a point and they're investing heavily. So we are seeing a definite tipping point in, in these technologies. So there are some of us that are out doing a lot of public speaking about this topic and building off of, of what Anne was talking about. In the transportation space, we're talking about the, the third revolution of mobility. So what do we mean by this third revolution? Um, if we think about sort of the first <coughs> generation of mobility that was around forever and ever and ever, how we moved ourselves, how we moved people, and how we moved goods, it was walking. And it was horse and buggy, horse and carriage for a very long time. Um, we had sort of a we don't quite consider this, uh, we, we could easily talk about five or six different revolutions in transportation, but things are, are a lot more compelling if we talk about three. So we'll throw trains back into still that first sort of setting. Um, and it was kind of revolutionary, at least city to city, how we moved. But it was really this era of cars and, and airplanes that was the first revolution of, of transportation that, that we talked about. When we're thinking about City of Portland, PBOT, PSU, when we're thinking about the work that I do at DKS, we don't, uh, we're not gonna talk in the rest of today around airplanes, because when we're thinking about neighborhood and community, um, there's not all that much that we can do on that side, but the car in particular is what we're gonna focus on here. And so we think about the last 100, 120 years and going from zero cars to 25,000 up to a billion 10 years ago, so I don't even know what that number is now, is this solving our mobility challenges? <clears throat> so I thought this is kind of an interesting fact that back in 1916, your horse and buggy would get you around London at an average speed of 17 miles an hour. And uh, a couple of years ago in the automobile, it gets you around London at an average speed of 12 miles an hour. So <laughs> I'm not sure that that's really, that the automobile has solved all of our um, mobility challenges. But when we talked about that first revolution from horse and buggy to cars, how fast did we go through this transformation as a society? Um, this Easter parades, this couple of pictures from New York City is a, a pretty good way of telling the story. In 1900, looking at the Easter parades, there was one automobile on the road and everything else that is shown there is horse and buggy and, and pedestrians walking down the street. A whopping 13 years later, it's all automobiles and one horse and buggy. So it's in, in just a little over a decade, we went from the vast majority of people moving around this way to the vast majority of people moving around that way. And why does that matter? You know, we talk a lot about this evolution that we're going to be talking about here and self-driving cars and scooters and some of these new emerging technologies. How fast is this really gonna happen? Nobody knows exactly, but I can tell you when we've gone through some of these in the past, it can happen very quickly to us as a society. <coughs> and there's a lot of costs that come along with um, this migration to the automobile. Um, as traffic engineers and planners, we almost everything that we do as professionals deals with one, two, or all three of these issues. Every project that we work on is either trying to deal addressing safety problems, uh, mobility and congestion problems. Um, environmental, we, we tend to see as more of a byproduct than what we should be focusing on, although states like California uh, is really leading in how can we have transportation help change the greenhouse gas um, emission uh, issues that we have. But we uh, focus a lot on, on the safety element of this, and especially as we get into these new technologies that we're going to be talking about, Societally, we have sort of flatlined out on this horrendous number of accepting the fact that somewhere between 30 to 35 to 40,000 people a year die on our roadway system, our highway system. That's just in the United States. Globally, it's, it's in the millions. It's just um, absolutely, uh, should be unacceptable to us as a society. It's interesting now, if you read a, a news article about a self-driving car, if one person dies, it's front page news everywhere. We're losing 40,000, 35 to 40,000 people a year as it is right now. And that's sort of the societal cost. There's a very true human cost about owning a car as well. And AAA runs these numbers every year 
that if you had the smallest and most efficient car, you're down around six to seven thousand dollars a year owning a car. If you have a pickup truck or SUV, you're probably around ten thousand dollars a year to own that car. And so you think about a lot of our, our people who are living on very tight incomes, very marginal incomes, how much of a huge percentage of their income ten thousand dollars a year is, and the kinds of life decisions if you're having to choose between making your car payment or buying food or buying medicine or whatever else. If you can reduce or remove this cost of ownership for those kinds of people, it could be really game changing. But those end up being a lot of times the same people as uh, James was talking about earlier that get chased out of, march, uh, moved out of neighborhoods that have good access to transportation and mobility and pushed further and further out to where they need, in many cases, to own a car. That's not a, a good societal um, trade out there. So that's a, I'm just planting some seeds for issues that we'll be hopefully talking about in a little bit. Second revolution, um, another very brief uh, history lesson. Um, back in the Eisenhower era, we had a little <coughs> defense project um, called the uh, Federal Highway, uh, Federal Aid Highway Act, or the National Interstate and Defense Highways Act. Uh, the, the elevation of overpasses when you're driving down the freeway is set at a certain height so that trucks carrying missiles can go underneath those overpasses. That was a defense project that funded the building out of our highway system, which has expanded into this massive highway and freeway system over, over the decades. And so the story she was talking about, about the communities that end up um, when, when we do a big project like this uh, with advancing our technology, advancing society, where can we afford to buy the property or what communities can we force to move out so that we can build the, the next right thing? Um, we have uh, this, this highway system of ours has really cut a lot of our cities into, into quadrants, really isolated different neighborhoods and, and really decimated a lot of communities. So, the, the point with both of those is hopefully we can learn from some of the mistakes that we've made in the past as we go and, and rapidly build these things because so much of this change is happening to us right now so fast and we learn from these mistakes. This isn't that kind of revolution or that kind of revolution. Um, in the mobility world, we talk about automated, connected, electric, and shared as these sort of four different things that are happening very fast in the transportation world, and they're all happening at the same time. And so really, ultimately, it's the convergence of these four different things that are happening at the same time that is drastically gonna change the way that people move from here to there. There's some definite potential good news with this whole story if, again, we learn from the mistakes we've made in the past. So I'm gonna start a little bit out of order to build up to Look to something here. So we'll start with the shared side of this um, because I, I don't think I need to spend too much time on what we mean in the car share community. That's something that everyone here has seen, experienced, used in one form or another, whether it's a ride share or a, a car share um, where you can go and use a, a car for a couple hours or a full day, a ride share that we go take a particular trip for that day. And it can a little cloudy sometimes working with some of these companies. Um, bike share. Um, and there's this uh, emerging concept of mobility as a service um, that has both sort of a physical component to it. And we talk about mobility hubs, where uh, at a single location you might have bike share and car share and scooter share and part of a connection into TriMet or any of your local public transit agency. And then a technology sort of component to this mobility as a service. So this, this screenshot over here, um, I actually took from my phone a couple of years ago from an app that was being built in Los Angeles. And the concept of mobility as a service, I, I wanna start my trip here and I wanna end it over here. What are all of my different options? I can take a scooter for the first six blocks and then I can take light rail over to here and then I take a lift at the other end. What does that cost me in dollars? What does that cost me in time? And even potentially, what are the environmental impacts? You kind of click on these different concepts and have it resort your trip options based on cost, time, or um, how environmentally friendly is that. The dream of this mobility as a service is in today, um, I don't have to be there in quite as much of a rush. So I'm going to go with the one that saves me the most money. I like option D. And I press that button and it 
purchases each of those different pieces of the trip for you. It sets up your, your scooter share, the first piece, buys your transit ticket, sets up your lift on the other end. We're not there yet. We're still a few years away from, from that. The, the financial element of that's far more complex <laughs> than it seems like it should be. The trip planning piece, we've got all kinds of apps that are doing this already. Um, but the, the beauty of this concept is people are already getting rid of their cars in, in many cases. But if we can make it that easy where you have multiple choices and you can just purchase, it starts to remove those, those barriers on why people need to own their car right now. Yeah, we'll go ahead and just do questions as we, as we go on. But I used to live in Massachusetts where they had tolls and I always wanted something that would calculate, like I'd say like, this is a car I'm driving. Yeah. Would it be cheaper for me to go around and not pay the toll? You know, yeah. and it would like calculate and pay the toll versus sure. the extra gas miles. Or yeah. so I haven't I haven't seen that built into any of the, the tools that I've seen so far. But as we continue to evolve with this whole concept, and especially if we start to get into other ideas of using road charging as uh, to help drive behavior, I think that. Definitely needs to be one of the factors that you look into. What is the true cost of getting to point from point A to point B and allowing me to choose that? So that eventually tolls or or congestion pricing or whatever else should be factored within that. Uh, transportation as a service, the acronym it's really the same thing as mobility as a service. There's a report that came out a few years ago. Uh, this organization called Re Rethink X or um, that was making some really bold predictions over the coming decades of, of people changing from the traditional model of I own my car and that's how I get from point A to point B to beginning um, increasing higher percentage of passenger miles or percentage of trips that will become mobility as a service. They're a little aggressive in their predictions, but I generally believe everything that they talked about in this report, Rethink Next, is going to come about, just maybe not as aggressively as they were talking about. Um, electric vehicles, we'll, we'll talk about that really quick here. Um, we've been talking again for decades and decades, and we've had a couple different uh, eras where we thought this is the dawn of the electric vehicles really going to take over. And, and then the combination of the oil industry and the auto manufacturing industry was always able to kind of squash that and then keep selling us the, the cars and keep us addicted to oil. Um, and part of the whole thing was they're not fast enough, they're not sexy enough, uh, there's not enough charging infrastructure. Um, and then, you know, it takes a few people to come along and make them sexy enough and make them fast enough and, and, and start breaking away some of those excuses and complaints that people have had. Um, but Tesla's not the only one doing this anymore. There's been a real tipping point in just the last couple of years where every auto manufacturer out there is now building an electric vehicle. And and when we think also about the, the, the convergence of these other issues around connected and autonomous vehicles, we think that this is just going to continue to tip, which is good, finally, with the bigger challenges that we have with the uh, air quality and, and uh, greenhouse gas emissions and other major global issues that we're trying to deal with. But it also means big implications in the infrastructure side. We're going to have to build a lot of this kind of stuff all around our cities to be able to support all those electric vehicles. So it changes the, the, um, the thinking when we're designing our streets and our roadways and our planning. Yep. I, it's something that I've heard and I, I hear different opinions on this of uh, what I'll ask you. So as I, what I've heard is that like uh, the way the current technology stands, the amount of impact uh, it takes to create an electric car, the amount of environmental impact it has, it's not, does not overcome the impact you get from not having emissions later on. So like it takes so much resources and emissions to make this vehicle that it does actually worth, it's not worth it to actually drive it later on. Is that something? It's, um, there, there is a whole lot of communications. I mean, a lot of uh, press about that particular topic. Um, so first of all, you got to look at what the source was and who did the research on it. A lot of those were funded by exactly who you might expect they were funded by. Mm -hmm. There's some very valid challenges with the kind of metals that we use to make the batteries. There's very realistic environmental challenges about the batteries themselves and what happens to these when, when the car's not there. There's a lot of environmental challenges that do need to be addressed, but it's like almost all of the, the real studies that look at the environmental footprint of an electric vehicle have, have debunked the particular issue that you're talking about. The other thing that people talk about a lot of times is, well, if the power that's produced to go into that car is produced by burning coal, 
then is it really that much cleaner if it's electric vehicle or a gas vehicle? And so, you know, if you're getting your power in West Virginia and all of the plants are coal plants, currently, maybe it's sort of a, you know, maybe it isn't that much better. But the thing about um, electric vehicles, we can change how clean the power is produced as we do more water and wind and solar and, and all these other things. We can't really make gas more, <laughs> in, you know, better than it is. So we can change that side of the equation. So I, um, there, there's real issues that are addressed, but I, almost all the real science sort of debunks the, the bigger, <coughs> bigger issue that you're talking about. So electric isn't just cars. Um, electric means a lot of smaller footprint vehicles too, all kinds of electric bikes and, and these micro mobility devices. As a traffic transportation engineer, I look at something like those micro mobility devices and I'd really rather be encouraging um, the deployment of those kinds of vehicles. When you, there's various images like this of what is the physical footprint and the environmental footprint that it takes to move 60 people in all these different modes. And so you think about those micro mobility devices and we're over in this range of footprint for parking and footprint for use of our right of way instead of this sort of range. This would be actually a lot more compelling if they would have used the same width and like that and have that line going you know, out the door that way. But you, you kind of get the idea here. So I'm, I'm generally a pretty big fan of the concept of these micro mobility devices. And if they're all charged and neatly stored and we've got great access and great safe ways of cruising around our roadways and people rode them safely like this, wearing their helmet and doing all the right thing, these would be wonderful and we could all just say, let's go, scooters everywhere. But this is how we see many of them parked. And this is how we see many of them ridden nowadays. At least it's shared, right? So, uh, <laughs> but you know, over and over again, and we see this looking down the street, how few people are actually wearing helmets with these things. And we know the safety issues and we know the parking issues. So we have a lot of work to do there. And, and the work isn't all just on these guys. You know, it's not all just making the scooter manufacturers build safer scooters, which we do need to do. And it, we do need to try to encourage uh, safer behavior, but we also need to work on our right away and our infrastructure and the same kinds of things that we've been doing with Vision Zero and dedicating lanes that are separate from traffic and making them safe for bikes and pedestrians is is what's going to really make this a lot safer for make scooters more successful. Yep. Are you that strongly advocating helmets for scooters? I am advocating um, making this mode as safe as we can make it. And I think that if more people wore helmets, they would be safer. I don't think that it's a type of situation where um, the city is going to be able to come in and say, we are going to mandate helmets by everybody and we're going to start handing out tickets. I don't think that's realistic and I don't think that's going to happen. But I do think anything that we can do from a policy standpoint or an infrastructure standpoint to make them safer is better. Do you apply mm -hmm. that logic to cars as well? I think. I guess I ask because I've looked up the statistics, at least with bicycles versus cars, yeah. and the number of. Uh, traumatic brain injury fatalities among car occupants is about 20 times the number among cyclists. So car helmets would actually be more. So we're looking at saving. The same number of cars and cyclists? No, no, total numbers. But but as a, as a public policy question, yeah, but they, the, I think the, the thing is that we would save presumably roughly currently 20 times as many lives by creating a norm of car helmets yeah, rather than of bicycle helmets. So, so, so is that, which do you apply that general logic that whatever makes things safer, we should add to cars? I think that, um, I think there's two different sub issues within your question. And one of the issues is that societally, we've been focusing on this conversation a lot because they, they popped up out of nowhere and there's a whole lot of conversation around safety with scooters. And it's why are we not having a similar conversation with safety in automobiles? We should be, so I, I agree with that. Um, there's maybe a third one that you aren't asking, but that we need to talk about. And that's that, um, the big safety issue in a lot of these cases isn't the scooter running into another scooter or the scooter running into a pedestrian. There's going to be bumps and bruises and some broken wrists, but where people are dying is going to be, is and going to be car on scooter and car on pedestrian. We're already seeing increase in those numbers. So we have to focus on that issue. And we are focusing a lot of attention on policy issues around this thing that just popped up two years ago and ignoring much bigger issues. So. So do, do you think that we should apply that same logic that anything that makes something safer should be required to cars as well? Um, 
So the word required wasn't something I was saying. Or or made anything no one, would anything you that we can do to make mobility safer so for everybody. Do you personally wear a driving helmet? I don't personally wear a driving helmet, but <laughs> advocate as a safety measure. I'm advocating for anything that we can do. I, I'm, I, I don't want to chew up sure. like all yeah. of our, our, our class on this topic. I, I think, um, we can take this offline. Yeah, of course. So um, connected vehicles are you know, something that people talk about a lot that in, in, in my world, in my space, I spend a lot of time on this, but it's not a very popular or commonly known thing of what, what a connected vehicle really is. And so we talk a lot about vehicle to vehicle communication within connected vehicle or B2B vehicle to infrastructure. So cars talking to one another saying, I am here, here's my heading, here's my speed, I'm slamming on my brakes, I have my right turn signal on, and another car being able to receive that and process that information and help right now inform the driver about what's going on around them or um, increasingly do things with the car, like actually slow the car down or warn the driver in one form or another. Um, or tell the driver that something up ahead, two miles from now, the, 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 the lane is closed for construction or there's an icy patch. Um, for decades to come, we're gonna be dealing with this mixed blend of non-connected vehicles that most of us drive, partially connected vehicles or fully connected vehicles. So again, as transportation engineers and planners, we're gonna have to be um, helping plan and, and deploy technology that works for both the non-connected vehicle and the connected vehicle. Um, I'm going to get into how AVs work, autonomous vehicles work it's really briefly because I do want to try to save a no. bit of time. I know we're running out. Um, so what is the relationship between the connected and autonomous vehicle? Um, there, hmm. There's this analogy that a square is always a rectangle, but a rectangle isn't always necessarily a square. Eventually over time, I'm hopeful that all of connected or all of autonomous vehicles will be connected vehicles, but a connected vehicle doesn't necessarily have to have any autonomy in it right now. And so I'll kind of explain what that means just really briefly and then we'll move into the exercise. But autonomous vehicles, uh, one of the things that I'm often trying to remind my clients and my own colleagues <coughs> is that it's not just this type of thing that we see in the media the most, a, a four person sedan with technology strapped on it, but trucks and vans and 10 or 12 person electric slow speed shuttles um, and semis are all the autonomous vehicles of the future in the coming decades. And some of these fleets are gonna be the ones that get deployed first. So we need to be thinking about those when we're doing our policy and our roadway design that it's not just one form factor in use, it's all of these different things, moving people and boxes. Um, I'm gonna say this from the, this level of discussion. Uh, just really briefly, the, the basic um, technologies that make a self-driving car. Onboard computer, high resolution mapping, and GPS. So where am I? Where am I? Where's my GPS tell me I am? Where am I high resolution mapping think I am? And then a series of sensors that are in some cases confirming I am six inches away from the right hand lane like I thought I was, or there's a bike or a pedestrian or an object in the roadway. And it's those sensors that give the vehicle situational awareness and is, is telling that onboard computer, in addition to where you think you are in the speed you should be traveling, there's this object that you need to be factoring into your decision making. And so this is kind of what the car sees with LIDAR and camera and whatever else. And so it's, it, it's pretty good at seeing what it sees right around it within that blanket of sensors that it, that it saw. And pretty good at making those decisions. But when it goes around this corner and those sensors can't see what's going on over here, that's where the connected component of this needs to come into play. But if the infrastructure and other cars can tell that onboard computer, not only is it everything that you see around you, but when you turn this corner, there's a pedestrian right here, then that car should be able to make a smarter, smarter decision. So, um, so how fast is all of this convergence of these four different technologies happening? It's happening right now. And, and many of these are already on our road. We're seeing all kinds of tests. Um, Waymo is now, uh, giving passengers rides in, in self-driving cars with no backup driver just as of this week. And this stuff is happening really, really fast. So, so with uh, the Maybe remaining, uh, we'll, we'll do one question. With the remaining 10 questions, we're going to ask just this one super easy question. <laughs> how, do we, how do we look at those three or those two earlier um, revolutions 
where we designed our cities and our roadway around the technology, around the car, and have been sort of working backwards to try to undo a lot of the decisions. Can we look ahead to say this convergence of all these things is happening? And how do we design our cities the way we want them to be and make the technology work for us instead of designing our cities around the technology? And you had a question before we kind of get into there? Yeah, it's just a quick question. And um, uh, but with the connectivity of vehicles and all the sensors, like the example that she just gave, I know one earlier this year through, um, you probably heard of it too, with um, Georgia Institution of Techn Technology, that they uh, came into like some one of the like cons of self-driving vehicles that they had a hard time detecting other darker skin tones. Yeah. So does those sensors have like the same kind of issue, like how self-driving cars kind of do? Or, or well, um, one of so this is. Uh, like Elon Musk and I like to get in arguments all the time. I remember attending an AK, I never talked to him. But so one, one, of the, one of the things that he's doing with Tesla that I fundamentally disagree with is instead of that whole blanket of sensors that, that I was showing in that one uh, image where it's cameras and LIDAR and radar and all these other types of, it, he's going sort of all in on cameras. So if you're going all in on video as your detection, you're like the, the first fatality when that car went right under that truck, you couldn't see the difference between a white truck and a white sky behind it. And so, yeah, if, if, if it's all video that it's, it's you know, a, like a person wearing all black in the dark or a person that is black in the dark, it's not going to see that as well as, as, but if it's combined with LIDAR and radar and other technologies, then it should be layering in other levels of redundancy to address those issues. Um, so, <laughs> again, I leave us uh, five minutes to answer the easiest question of the whole thing. How do we take that whole big block of crazy technologies that Ann was talking about before and all these fast emerging transportation technologies that I was talking about here and not be talking 20 years from now with the new technological version of Jane's story of how the technology happened to us in different neighborhoods that worked really well for this group that was at the table and part of those conversations, but didn't work so well for these other groups. How can, you know, can we learn from these lessons and what is, what is civic engagement, community outreach and communications look like? So you got five minutes to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, how, how do you want to do this? <laughs> we were going to break it into groups, but, maybe uh, but we don't have enough time. So I think um, just, start um, yeah, start chatting. And, um, Share. So um, I mean, my pitch is basically we need to go, we need to go all in, but way, way in on mass transit um, for many reasons. Like you said earlier, we're going to have all sorts of cars, fully connected, somewhat connected, not at all connected, and that just makes it extremely complicated. Yes. And we have more control over the vehicles, we can greatly control the safety. But especially in cities and urban areas where there's a high degree of density, we can create equitable uh, transportation <coughs> systems that meet the needs of everyone. And there, are, it's going to be really hard to prove that you need a car uh, if you create the city well. And that's really hard to pull off. There's a lot of challenges. But I firmly believe we can create a system that works well for everybody within that densely populated area. And that's the, the catch, obviously. People live outside of that area, and unfortunately, that's often the people who live. Well, if, you, if you think about the congestion problems that we're dealing with, um, so we'll, we'll put the equity piece out of it just for a second, which is you can't put it out, but just for a second, just talk about the congestion piece. And if we have this many problems with 1.2 drivers on average per car, autonomous vehicles and even Uber and Lyft shared vehicles are not going to solve that problem at all. A self driving car, half the time, it's going to have nobody in it. So, you know, is, is that going to solve our condition problem? No, all of these things need to happen and they need to happen in conjunction with better investment in, in transit. So public transportation looked at Uber and Lyft and scooters and a lot of these other things that were happening initially as competition. And what they really need to do is rethink that whole thing and say what we need to do is look at all of those other mobility choices as first and last mile options to make the service that we offer better, more affordable, more effective for everybody. Let's focus on high 
high, need, high speed, high reliability corridors, move as many people on, on public transportation along those corridors as possible, and use all these other things as how to, how to get people to and from those corridors. Yeah, I just wanted to echo uh, just the fact that like public transit wasn't mentioned at all in this whole presentation. I thought that was kind of odd. And, um, doesn't seem like if you're talking about smart cities and you're not talking about public transit, you're being very smart. Um, I also want to just point out that like mobility isn't a service, it's a right. And we should be focusing on like accessibility is like our number one goal, and, like uh, making transportation as equitable and accessible uh, for all people. Um, but I guess like specifically towards that question in regards to like making technology work for us, I think for me, the most like frightening bit of all this is, is the idea of uh, autonomous vehicles, especially in terms of just the, the jobs and the lives that they're gonna destroy. Um, I don't think that that's a equitable path forward for technology, for the transportation at all. Um, and yeah, I think we should oppose that at all costs. So I, I want to uh, separate those those two topics. So the first one, I, I totally appreciate over what you're saying. I was asked to compress a hour long conversation about the future of transportation down into 20 minutes. And so what I was trying to focus on with this is what are the big massive changes that are happening within the transportation agency or industry. And so I but I, but I still appreciate the point that if we are talking about smart cities and smart mobility and recognizing that public transportation is at the root of moving people equitably and safely, I, you know, I, that can't not be part of the conversation. So I think that even for my own purposes as I move forward, I, I need to cut out two minutes somewhere else and, and bring that back in. On the second point around um, automation, uh, it, this one is a really challenging bigger picture problem is as we automate any industry, people are going to lose jobs. And this has happened, you know, for every generation for the industrial revolution, the way that, you know, we manufacture automobiles using robots and et cetera, and, and displacing those jobs. It's, it's, it's not a realistic thing to say um, that we should oppose evolution of, trans, of, of technology because jobs are going to get lost. What, what I, 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 the, the, the bottom line um, capital uh, corporate element of this, there's just too much money at stake for too many players to, to say that we're, that this isn't going to happen. But what I think what we need to be doing is saying, what are the jobs of the future? Because every time that we have displaced certain jobs with automation of that particular functionality, new jobs have emerged. What we need to be doing is thinking forward into the coming decades, not be surprised that, that truckers' jobs are lost 30 or 40 years from now and that people aren't driving Ubers 15 years from now or however long it's going to take to get to enough of a mass of these new technologies until those jobs are lose. What, what are the new jobs and are we training our, our kids starting all the way in grade school on through college for the new jobs and the new careers of the future? I, that, that's the argument that I think we aren't having nearly enough of, personally. To bring equity back into it, yeah. if shared ride share now is losing a billion dollars a quarter or yeah. something ridiculous based upon the rates that they're charging. Which I highly subsidize industry right now. Fundamentally the equivalent to cabs, just taking the human element out of it obviously drastically reduces the cost. But if your uh, smart cars to get people around are still driving one and two people around, how does that technology be priced when it needs to make money and it's not heavily subsidized and eligible to the minimum wage worker who wants to get from their house to their job? Yeah. yeah. So that, um, there's, again, a, a couple different components within that question. So the, fir the first part of it is the cost of an Uber or Lyft right now, even as underpaid as those drivers are, 70 or 80% of the cost of every trip is going to the driver. So it's not like the idea of getting the driver out of that equation and having a self-driving car and moving people isn't just sort of incrementally a little bit better financially for them. It's 70 or 80% of the cost of that trip that isn't going to the driver anymore. So it's a pretty huge cost savings to those companies. Um, 
There's a whole bunch of other economic factors because the fleets now become owned by the company instead of owned by the individual driver, right? The doesn't own the car. The right, so there's the economics are, are, are super it's complex, complex. But, I have um, technological vehicle. but but the automation of Lyft is, does not deliver us an equitable transportation solution. I mean, that's the, the fundamental point that you're bringing up and that, that, would, that has been brought up already a couple different times. If this can be an a element of an overall transportation solution along with good high speed, high capacity, high highly reliable transit, transit corridors, then it's part of an overall mobility ecosystem, but it's not the, the solution. Land use. Land use is, <laughs> do we have another hour? <laughs> we don't have another hour. We should, we should, that should be the last. I feel bad. I want to be respectful of your time. It's 843. Um, they're still here if you want to ask more questions. I think maybe for the next five, ten minutes or so. But I want to be respectful of your time. And we had a class exercise that we should have been going over. So we need to be more respectful of well, hope, Hopefully, hopefully you yeah. can take at least the, the concepts of where all of this stuff is going and, and, and work this into the other conversations. Really, the whole point of this class is how do we deliver this to our neighborhoods and our communities and make it equitable and make it um, make it a, a, a basic right for all of our citizens, like you were saying. I absolutely agree with that. Um, and sorry, three hours worth of content in the two hour class. <laughs> Thank you.